Hello everybody, welcome to Success Defined. I'm Ben McDonald, and today we are joined by Terry Gallagher. Terry has a strong background surrounding talent, workforce, and employees, and now she's the president and CEO of Gallagher and Consultants. Terry, thanks for joining us. Ben, I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, hopefully I give all of you something useful that you can take away and say, I'm so glad I watched that. So <laughs> that's our intent today. That's so right. Thank you. No, absolutely. No, we're going to be able to get into a, a <laughs> lot of valuable things, so they're in for a treat. So. I want to start, you worked at Walt Disney for eight mm -hmm. years, so there were a couple things there that I want to hit on. Um, so yeah. before we get really specific, uh, what were a couple of those takeaways from your experience with Disney? Well, I think um, one of the things I learned working for Walt Disney World is the attention to customer service and detail. No one does it like Walt Disney World as far as you know how they build their brand and, and um, how they kind of just pay so much attention to the customer, things like not selling gum in the park so you don't get gum on your shoes and things like that kind of level of detail just kind of sticks in your DNA. And I think even at that point, I kind of created my own little job, you know, and it was something that they let me do. And I think that was my first glimmer of um, that entrepreneurial uh, bug because once you get it, you can't get rid of it. So they gave me a lot of latitude to to create my role. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect, and and that leads into one of the those specific things I wanted to talk about. So you took ownership there from from really early on, and a lot mm -hmm. of it probably has to do with the culture, right? Like you said, they mm -hmm. they breed that type of mentality and mm -hmm. give you the ability to. But you oversaw Disney's first their organized uh, temporary staffing program for IT professionals. Mm -hmm. So really taking ownership in that one thing and then flourishing it and being a leader in a major organization. Um, where, where did that trait come from of taking ownership in something? Well, I think some of that, for those of you that, you know, are own, do own your own business, you're, you're thinking about it. I think it's just that, um, you know, one of the, some of the feedback that I would get when I was working for someone else is, you know, you really need to be in a position where you create your own path or you need to paint on your own canvas. And I think, it's just innate, you know, and taking that initiative and wanting to create something and wanting to build something special. I think the key is, is to be in an environment that is conducive to that. And when you're in an environment that is not, um, and that's where we're going to, we're going to talk about why this growth of the gig workforce is happening. Um, that can be challenging if you've got that entrepreneurial yeah. spirit. I think companies today, if they're thinking right, they're going to start encouraging more of that within mm -hmm. their ranks. Hey, have you seen that more as you start to work with more and more businesses, uh, companies being open to that type of mentality of, of uh, encouraging uh, that type of entrepreneurship mentality? Well, if you look at, you know, just the growth of the gig workforce, you know, it's going to be 40 to 50 percent of our workforce in a couple of years. And so companies are really starting to embrace these flexible ways of getting work done, which in itself organically builds that entrepreneurial right. spirit. So companies are kind of being forced to embrace this more as people are changing the way that we want to work. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And then Disney was just ahead of its time, which allowed you to- It's the companies will always be ahead of its time. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're spot on. So you had other past experiences that mm -hmm. have given you the foundation to what you're doing today. So so I want to talk on that. What are those past experiences that, that you're applying to what you're doing now? That's a good question. You know, it's interesting. I think one of them, um, believe it or not, is I was a secretary when I first started out. So people don't think of that as building, you know, an entrepreneurial mindset, but that follow through being organized, um, respond, you know, responding back to people, all of those things that are kind of old fashioned, but they're things that have gotten me, gotten Gallagher huge clients. Mm -hmm. um, and then that other piece is I just think a strong sense of personal accountability you know, okay. is, is really important regardless of, you know, any type of role that you, mm -hmm. that you take. Yeah. That's a mentality that not everybody shares, right? Some people are able to develop it over the years, mm -hmm. but, but other people struggle with it. Um, where did that come from in your background? How are you capable and comfortable doing that? <laughs> well, that's funny you mentioned, you know, my background is, you know, I grew up pretty blue collar. Um, people are actually surprised. I grew up in the projects, you know, at one point in my life, you know, there's a little bit of family challenges but it really kind of toughened me up you know and it really kind of taught me from an early age that you really are responsible for your own destiny and what you achieve in life and I think there's so many people that we you know go to their graves not even exploring and expanding on everything that they can do you know so I think that 
you know, I say, you know, people are like, if I'm in a negotiation, like, God, you're really tough for a girl, <laughs> you know, and I'll say, well, you know, I kept four of the toughest girls from stealing my bike when I lived in the projects. So that's where I, I learned that. But I think that just that, um, we are the masters of our own destiny. And I, and even when I was in corporate America, I'd see a lot of that victim mentality. Like I'm not getting ahead because my boss has got it in for me or the company's not providing me opportunity. And even I did it early in my career when I was younger. Um, and the reality is that just holds you back. Right. We all can do whatever we want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and now you're, you're being an example, not only by working for people, but also or working with people, but also showing yourself, Mm -hmm. what that mentality can do and, and changing your mindset to be able to to create those opportunities and not really handcuff yourself. Well, so. yeah, you kind of have to, right. as you know, when it's your business, right? Yeah. It's the buck stops with you. Yeah. yeah, so you're even if business owners aren't comfortable with it, they're almost forced into it. It's either succeed by being uncomfortable or stay comfortable and then you're, you're never going to get the chance to flourish. Well, you know, it's funny, I watch a lot of motivational videos like Ed Milet and um, there's there's a ton, you know, yeah. Tony Robbins. I watch something every morning. I'm like a junkie for TEDx. And one of the things that Ed Milet said is he said that starting your own company is the best self-development program, hands down, because you will quickly find out where your weaknesses are. Like you think you're done with your crap and there's a whole other layer of stuff <laughs> that comes up when you start your own business. And the insecurities and am I good enough and I'm able to do this. So it's like kind of conquering those demons and getting to that next level and being uncomfortable on a daily basis just molds you into an amazing version of yourself. Yeah. Um, before we get more into Gallagher and consultants, uh, mm -hmm. you touched on something I want to dive a little deeper into. Yeah. Um, what has self-development, what is, kind of role has that played in your life? Um, well, I always hate that term because it sounds so hippy dippy like I'm going off, you know, and <laughs> Um, but I think self-development is really just um, embracing your weaknesses and, and being okay with those and then really either building on your strengths or recognizing where you need to kind of go to the next level or what makes you uncomfortable. Like I learn now, you know, fear is my friend, you know. I call fear Natasha. She's this wolf that's like someday she's like at my throat and then other days, it's like, I've got the fear under control, but I learned to kind of run towards it and embrace it because on the other side of that is the best version of yourself, yeah. really. Yeah. No, no, that's great. So, and, and yeah, you can hear, there are a lot of things now that people almost overuse as marketing ploys, like self-development and things right. like that. Um, but you take away the stigma behind it and there's so much value that things like that can provide to your life. Completely. So, I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into Gallagher and Consultants. So let's. Okay, yeah. um, <laughs> I was gonna wear a big sandwich board and just have my logo on there, it, but I figured that'd be inappropriate. We should, we should have just stuck there it right behind. Yeah, why didn't you? And next time I'll bring it. There you go. Um, describe to everybody exactly what Gallagher and Consultants is, and then then I've got a bunch of follow-ups. Obviously, oh, great. Well, we um, I built this company. I started this company a little over three years ago. Um, I came from the staffing space. And um, I wanted to build a different model around how companies can manage gig workforce labor. Okay. So a big part of what we do is I've got a trademark ecosystem model. And, and basically what it is, is I'm a professional orchestra conductor. So I bring in the different instruments that are needed to help companies put processes and technology around all of their non-traditional labor and embrace that labor yeah. and then integrate that labor into a total workforce strategy. So we work with um, different technology providers. Our model, our differentiators, it's very consulting centric and very technology centric. Whereas the traditional model of managing gig workforce comes from the staffing companies. So, you know, the big you know, manpower top Finron Stott, it's and their model is has been the go-to for 20 years, but it's very requisition fulfillment centric and not really talent strategy. Okay. Those are the companies I worked for before I started this. And so I said, well, I think we need to do this differently and either I can stay and collect my 250k a year and kind of continue to, to roll out what is the traditional model or I could go out and change yeah. the, how we deliver and so that's what I did and uh, leaving that 250k a year was, <laughs> was it was hard yeah, yeah that's <laughs> that part's really hard yeah it it's got to be difficult to to make the pivot from um, a comfortable life mm -hmm. versus getting into uh, 
really a whole lot of unknown, right? Mm -hmm. By going off on your own. So there must have been a lot of meaning behind it. So can you go into that a little bit? What really pushed you over the edge of saying, I'm going to leave this, this comfortable position and get really uncomfortable because of the impact you can have or, or the opportunity or whatever it was right. for you? Well, truth be told, I was fired. So they, they made that really yeah. easy. Yeah. You know, in fact, I have nothing but gratitude. But, you know, they basically said, we're not ready for you yet. And they were right. You know, I was trying to do all of these really progressive things in this environment that wasn't ready. And um, so that was just kind of the kick and the catalyst that I needed to kind of embrace that I am a bit of an outlier and, and, an, and I want to do different things. And um, so that was kind of the, what got me started. And then just kind of um, my, my customers motivate me, my clients motivate me that, you know, I see what they need and I want to provide that. Mm -hmm. That's every single day. That is, I, that's why I get out of bed every morning. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So you had mentioned your, your ecosystem model. So mm -hmm. it's, it's the workforce solutions ecosystem model. Uh, could you give a kind of sneak preview to the viewers and listeners of, of some of what that consists of? Yeah, I wish I, I should have brought a visual if I was super prepared. We can, like, we can like, have links and stuff. Okay, too, great, like Ben is. Um, yeah, so basically it is a, it's a trademarked model and it's based on the premise of you have a central orchestrator and then this orchestrator manages the other ecosystem providers, which is technology, vendor management, solutioning, analytics, um, change management, um, global expertise. And so unlike the traditional models, which is this very kind of static, you use this technology and, and this ops model, this is much more fluid. And it's like a menu approach. Um, but I deliberately made it very technology centric. I think that the new model of gig workforce and contingent workforce management is going to be around technology, yeah. right? You can go and hire, you can go and task grab it, you can hire Uber, you can hire a lawyer, you can do all of these things online. Um, and technology is gonna be the delivery system for this talent. Yeah. And how did you create this model? I, how did it come together for you as, as you're going off on your own and you're trying to create this this new type program? Because like you said, you were, you were kind right. of ahead on a few things. How did you end up creating it? We well, you know it's interesting, you know, with women, I think we do our best work when we're really angry. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, you know, my other, my ex-company that I left, I talked about this strategy that I'd sort of put together. It wasn't fully formed and they kind of blew it off. You know, it was like one of the companies I left and they said, but if you want to bring us some business, you know, we'll take your business. And um, I was like woman possessed. I was up till four in the morning and I sketched it out and I put it together. And then I was asked to do a speaking engagement to talk about it through CXC Global. They invited me to Ireland to, to talk about this. And I was like, holy crap, I better figure out what it looks like. Right. And there was, um, or not, um, this was in Ireland, I'm sorry, this was um, Future of Work in San Francisco. So there was all these like super millennial, smart, like startup gig workforce, you know, tech guys who were sitting on 50 million in VC capital and I was like oh my god I'm this middle-aged chick going up to talk about this thing and no one's gonna care and I remember when I was done and they were like you nailed it and I was just like that's when I knew I was on to something yeah there was there was a little bit more proof right when yeah there was some energy there. in the room so yeah yeah, yeah. no that, that's perfect um, you've talked about kind of a little bit of, of who you focus on and why but Talk more about why you actually specialize in, in non-traditional workforce. Well, it's my background. So most of my career has been spent in putting processes around non-traditional labor. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that that's just where we're headed today. You know, the traditional employment construct is crumbling. You know, the nine to five working in a building for the same person is giving away to this more kind of fluid workforce. So I think that we are going undergoing a radical change in how work gets done. And, you know, many say we're in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution with artificial intelligence and all of these different ways that you can get work done. So I just feel like our solution on our company is at the cost. Mm -hmm. And this is where I want to be, where the action's happening and be at the forefront of that change, not responding. Right, yeah. But driving it. There are still a lot of business leaders that, that are fighting against that change of, of the, the fluid workforce and people being able to to work from home and, and having these temp type positions. What's your response to that? Why is it a positive change for, for our economy, for the businesses? Why is it positive? 
Well, I think, um, you know, maybe fighting is a strong word, but there's a lot of confusion or misinformation, you know, that this workforce is not viable, they're not going to be as dedicated. Um, some of your best workers now can only be found in the non-traditional community. So I think a lot of that is just educating um, companies on how they can leverage this workforce more effectively and also respecting the fact that a big part of the workforce is still going to be traditional labor. Right, but it's. I think the education is is the most important piece, and showing them how to do it, and showing them how it's going to help their business. You know, being able to be flexible in today's economy prevents layoffs. Right. Right. Because if you, if a market shifts, you can get rid of thirty contractors rather than lay off thirty people. Yeah. And plus, those thirty contractors want to work that way. They're like, cool, because I've got four more gigs lined up. Yeah. Peace. Thank you so much. Peace out. You know. Right. Yeah. The businesses that are, um, and you said fighting is, is a strong word, and, and it is, but the people that are anti-change, right, they mm -hmm. want to kind of stick with the traditional model, mm -hmm. are they going to become archaic where they're just behind the times and not able to keep up, or or is that going to be something that's farther down the road where they they don't need that change immediately, but, but should? That's a great question. You know, I think... Um... You know, there's always going to be a place for those folks, right? Because you need kind of the naysayers and the ones to kind of maintain the culture of an organization. But a lot of these changes are coming now from the bottom up, you know, where you've got a manager or someone in IT says, hey, I found these 30 developers on Catalant or TopTal or Upwork or whatever, and then they're driving the change. Yeah. And then making those folks that you're talking about kind of respond to that. Yeah. Um, but eventually they're going to 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 have to yeah. right yeah yeah no absolutely it was just it's uh you're the first one on on the the podcast where i can really dive deep on this topic so it's nice to get oh, different you. different perspectives um and it's kind my of favorite thing to talk about okay, good. <laughs> um so you work with with a lot of different businesses being able to go in and help with what you're specializing in mm -hmm. what are some of those top mistakes that you see when you go in and help these businesses Oh, top mistakes. Um, I think as far as, I, I don't know if it's mistakes, but I think it's just really understanding where and how this workforce kind of fits in. Okay. You know, when do you leverage a permanent person versus when can you just bring on a consultant or an independent consultant? And then having a process around that, you know, and being able to then leverage that workforce when you need it. Because there's... Uh, you know, it's kind of like with permanent labor, you've got all this infrastructure in place, right? Mm -hmm. You've got market rates and you've got reporting and analytics right. and that's not in place for your contingent labor. So right. Very true. bringing in those different components to manage it more effectively is important. Yeah. So for the business leaders and the business owners that are watching or listening, what's one thing that they could implement today uh, that you think would be able to, to jump them forward in, mm -hmm. in the business? I think hands down technology. Um, for contingent workforce, a vendor management system, you know, managing the onboarding to offboarding, because right away you take care of 90% of your problems. You've got your visibility, you've got life cycle management, you've got um, risk mitigation for independent consultants, you've got dashboards, and you've got some type of controls um, and frameworks, even like manufacturing, where they've got temp labor is the most at risk for death and injury because they don't always go through orientation. Okay. Um, so having a technology that will then ensure that that takes place and have check marks mm -hmm. not only is the right thing to do and will save you money from not getting an OSHA risk but it saves lives yeah. so the technology start there yeah no that's perfect um i like to get tangible in this stuff so i appreciate yeah. that um, being a, a business owner and business leader um, everybody that runs a business has different pain points what are one or two of those pain points in, in your business right now that you're facing Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the two the two bigs, at least for me personally, is I had to learn how to sell. Because okay. if you don't know how to sell, you don't have a business. You don't have clients. And I had no clue how to sell. So I think learning how to do that, I did it badly the first couple of years. I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. I still get lessons and help from people that do sales training. And then I think the second thing is... Um, Trusting your own instincts, okay. especially for women, because I think we have a tendency to, to trust everyone else around us or maybe even give our power away a little bit because, mm -hmm. well, you know, I've just started this business. I don't know what I'm doing. This person knows what they're doing and they've been running a business for X number of years and 
So I think the biggest thing is, you know, get counsel and get mentorship, but also trust your, your inner, your inner compass. It's, it's more accurate than you think. Yeah. I want to, I want to pivot away from, from the current business for a second, because you hit on something I think is extremely important and that's women leadership and, and women uh, business ownership. It's a topic that is, is getting more traction. Um, but it's still, there's still a gap, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so, so I want to dive into that a little bit. Um, first off, you're, you're somebody that's experiencing it. So what are some of those hurdles that, that you face? Well, I think the biggest is this is common. You see this in, um, you know, in, in Silicon Valley as well, but financing, you know, I think that there, I do believe that there's a little bit of discrimination at subtle, you know, when you're a woman, you go to get financing. I remember several times they're like, Oh, is your husband, is this your husband's business or things like that? Um, so I think that that's still a challenge. And then I, I think the other piece of it is the way that business gets done until things change is very traditionally male. You know, it's very much about being competitive, um, speaking succinctly, not taking things personally, not being a perfectionist. Um, and so women, the way that we, we lead and run our businesses, we tend to be more collaborative. We tend to be more, um, you know, less competitive and more, and, and more like let's bring the group together. And so I think that there's a big part of, even though business is changing and women are influencing and shaping businesses, it's still very much a male environment. Right. And so I think you've got to kind of adopt traits that are going to grow your business. Mm-hmm. And when in Rome, you know. Yeah. So, what are some of those things that need to change for uh, for women to be able to be more comfortable playing in in that type of field? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think culturally, I think what what would be valuable is first of all just to have more women in leadership positions, right? right? Because as more women occupy leadership positions, we are going to organically change the culture. And then conversely, you know, um, who, there's actually, um, Sealed Air did this. They bought a book called The 12 Steps That Hold Women Back, and then they actually started this whole group, and then they actually got a lot of women leaders like on board with teaching other women, and you know, what are some things that women do that hold ourselves yeah. back? So you see companies doing things like that. Um, but I think a lot of it is just getting the women in leadership and then culturally teaching women how to operate within leadership roles because there's a lot that we do that we hold ourselves back. Right, right. And, and there's also different perspectives too, which is extremely valuable in business, mm-hmm. right? And so um, men, men and, and women, both. yeah, men and women typically think about things, they go about problems and solving differently, right? Just like people with different backgrounds do. Um, but that, having different mentalities within a business and within leadership leads to more success because you get different perspectives. So agree. Yeah. So you have the, the things that need to change on the culture side, right? The, uh, um, the people, the venture capitalist not asking if it's your husband's <laughs> business, which is just crazy that that happens. Oh but, yeah. Um, but things like that. And then God also, I know, right. And then, uh, business is starting to take the initiatives, uh, of, putting women in there and empowering them right into Mm -hmm. those leadership positions and letting them, them run. What do the women viewers and listeners that that we have today, what do they need to do to be able to get into those, those leadership positions or take the leap to start their own business? Well, I think a lot of it's just ask, you know, um, you'd be surprised how much people want to help you get promoted or, or the opportunities are there if you just like step up and ask and say, this is something that I want to do and speak up. I think another thing that we don't do enough of is toot our own horn and take credit for our work. Mm -hmm. Um, I know in in my previous life working for different companies, I watched other people take credit for my work and I used to feel like bother me personally and I would take it personal. But the reality is, well, if I'm not going to speak up, they're going to speak up. They're just doing what they need to do for their career. So I think that's the biggest. And is that a humility thing uh, for you anyways of, of not wanting to go out there and to journal or brag? Yeah, because we're, you know, a lot of women were, we are groomed to be collaborative and to help each other and be team oriented. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that we're groomed really to step up and speak up and say, Hey, I did that. I rocked, you know? So yeah. I think that that's something that we, we've got to do more of. Yeah. We've got a three-year-old daughter and we're already trying to teach her <laughs> those type of mentalities, but it's, uh, 
grooming the the mentality early on hopefully will will be a game changer well she's uh and growing up in this world she's probably already got a pretty good sense of who she is yeah different generation absolutely yeah so no i appreciate you taking that pivot because i think it's an important topic so um i want to get more into into you uh, on the personal side a little bit so you've been running this business for about four years right you've taken Mm -hmm. that that leap and, and you've started this what's your grand vision for gallagher and consultants my grand vision, well, first of all, I have a huge financial target. You know, everyone's supposed to say, oh, I'm doing this fulfillment because, you know, success looks to me like, you know, I want to <laughs> do something important or change the world. Frankly, I want, I have a very aggressive um, financial target that I want to get my company to. I think money provides freedom. Okay. I think it provides you ways to do more, right? So if you look at Bill and Melinda Gates, right, they've got this $50 billion, the yep. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They're... Yep doing amazing things like bringing water to millions of people and agricultural and um, these really philanthropic things. But the way that Bill earned that money is being a ruthless businessman. He put people out of business. You know, he just, he went for it. So I think it's that, that, that balance. I think that that's really important. And then also from a customer perspective, I generally started this company because I think we needed to change the model and how we service customers. And you'll see that on my, I have a video on my website, um, the traditional model around managing non-traditional talent, I think is very outdated. Yep. And so I started this company to address that challenge. And when I first started Gallagher, my first six months, I did nothing but fly and drive to previous clients and say, what would you like to see different? Okay. What are you looking yeah. for? And I literally built my model based on that, that response. Yeah, really interesting. Um, and I was watching or listening to something the other day that was talking exactly on what you just hit on of having that positive impact. There are the Tom Shoes type companies where that's mm-hmm. that's everything they do, right? But the the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation coming from be a successful business first and then use that yes. position, those resources to have the greater impact. More often than not, you end up having a greater impact by being a business first and then going to what's more, most important to you. So I don't think there's the right or wrong answer where you said most people should feel like they should sit here and talk about that's the, true. the fluff type stuff, but there's not a right or wrong answer. People go about it both directions and it's just what fits you and what your, your end goal is. So how do you balance those, those grand visions of, of what the, the big pie in the sky type goals are? How do you balance that with what you have to do on the day to day? Um, that's a great question. I actually have a one year one. I have a one page business plan. I don't okay. believe in big long protracted right. business plans. I, I personally think they're a waste of time and too many things change. And then I use a project management tool. I use Asana and I literally have color coded like sales and marketing, operational client execution, and even like spiritual health learning. And I <laughs> assign a percentage to each. And then I just put in every morning or at night, those things I want to achieve that kind of, contribute to each of those goals and I really try to stay um, what's going to drive my business the furthest I usually do those first and I'm fanatical about it I will check that thing sometimes 10 times a day and make sure that I'm staying on target with what I want to do that day and I don't hit everything I over arc and there's always a couple things Mm -hmm. I can do at the end of the day but yeah no I like it though it's you've got that vision but you're almost stepping backwards like this is where I want to be now how do I get there not just on the, the big goals, but also on the day-to-day, what do I need to do to stay on track? And then too, you know, my team, you know, we work, we, I don't have any permanent employees because I sell the gig workforce. <laughs> so I practice what I preach. Um, my entire company is made up of consultants, you know, and some of them have other gigs, or other things they're working on. So kind of also keeping track of them. And, yeah. But because they're consultants, you know, I don't have to stay on top of them every minute right. of the day. Right, they're, they're kind of doing pretty, their thing. Pretty, savvy smart people yeah yeah what's what are those one or two of your favorite things that you're doing right now in in your life oh my god um i think creating you know that's always like i actually love doing stuff like this like doing videos and podcasts um i've written i write it quite a bit but i think anytime i get to be creative and create a new solution or this um I've got a brainstorming session with a pretty big software provider in our space and they're flying here. And so we're going to be doing that in a couple of weeks and really excited about that because we want to create a whole new service offering. Mm-hmm. So those are the kinds of things that I love. 
doing. But it's interesting. I was telling a friend of mine who love him dearly. He's he's an amazing, talented entrepreneur, but he can't stay with anything. Okay. You know those people yeah. like he doesn't know why he's not making more money, but he doesn't stay with anything longer than a year for it to take hold. <laughs> and I said, you know, the reality is to create something amazing and to get all the things you want to do in life. Like for me, eighty percent of my day is spent on stuff I don't want to do. You know, and I don't know about you, yeah. but it's like. It, 80% of the day is like stuff you hate doing or don't want to do to get that 20% yeah. that gets you excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the part I think a lot of people struggle with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of, there's a lot of misperception when it comes to business ownership, entrepreneurship. And a lot of it has to do with, we've had a, a great market since 2009. So mm -hmm. a lot of people can go out and just be successful almost accidentally. Mm -hmm. But there's a flood of this entrepreneurship without people really understanding what effort it takes. You're so right. And, yeah. and how much more work goes into it than a typical nine to five job. And you're, you don't have the nine to five because you can, I was up at 545 this morning working on posting content online, right? Like that, that's not in the entrepreneur job description. <laughs> you weren't like sipping a Mai Tai on the beach on your laptop just right. making money with your funnel? No? Yeah. No, no, there's a little bit more to that. But yeah, there's that misperception. I agree. And, and you've got to be able to stick to something, see it through and adapt to the changes, um, but be able to have that that long-term goal with the day-to-day -day stuff you need to do, exactly how you have it set up. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go into some of the more kind of philosophical type stuff. So. Um, we just talked about some of the things you enjoy the most. If you were to design a perfect day, what are some of those things that you would include in that day? What stuff do you want to do in a perfect day? Can I say afternoon drinking? No. Um, you can say whatever you like. It is so much fun, but yeah, there goes all my meetings. You know, the perfect day, I think, if there is such a thing, is, and I'm not going to go through the whole, I get up at five and I right. drink my protein shake, which I don't do any of that. Um, but I think it's, at the end of the day, I feel like, wow, I moved the needle a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like I really did something that inched my company forward or I contributed something meaningful for a client or I, like today, you know, this podcast, hopefully this comes out good and, and that was helpful. But I think that's to me that I, I did something tangible and, yeah. and meaningful. Not so much getting through the checklist because even though I am super organized, I hate doing that. I just, it's a necessary evil. Yeah. No, that's and that's fine. That answer is going to be different for everybody, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's it's why I like asking it. Um, if you were mentoring a business leader today, what would be those one or two kind of pieces of advice or guidance that you'd want to be able to get across to them? You know, I think um, the first thing is to be a student. And to continually learn because I think those are the people that are truly successful. I think the ones that think they've got, they know everything. You know, when you talk to them, like, oh, yeah, I know that. Right. You know, I think that leaves you vulnerable. You know, it leaves you vulnerable, frankly, to companies like myself who are constantly innovating right. and open and wanting to learn more. Yeah. So I think it's, it's be a student, but still have that strong belief in, in what you contribute and what you value. And then I, I think the, the second thing is, especially for women. I keep saying this, and you too, but we are so much more powerful than we know. Yeah. You know, so many of us go to our graves not tapping into 90% of what we can achieve. So perpetually being uncomfortable and being a little fearful or going beyond your comfort zone are the things that are going to help you really explore and tap into the mm -hmm. things you never knew you could do. Like, I'm doing stuff now. There is no way two years ago I would have the guts to do. In fact, frankly... If I knew everything I was going to have to go through when I started this company, I probably wouldn't have done it. Seriously, I'm pretty sure that I would have been too scared because, yeah. but the fact that I was naive was a huge yeah. plus. Well, and those lessons that you want to get across, it's, it, you practice what you preach, right? Earlier right. you were talking about being a big TEDx fan and watching these videos and things yeah, like that. Every day. That's you being a student and, and continuing to grow yourself all the time. So you're practicing what you preach. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I read, um, I read a book a week. Okay. So I definitely, I am definitely a student. Yeah. Book a week, I'd say so. <laughs> so how, how do you define success in your life? And that can be personally, professionally, 
probably as business owners, it's a mix of both, but how do you define success in your life? Well, I think, you know, we talked about, you know, financially, I think um, it's getting my company to a, a certain financial, right. I have a very specific goal. And then also, you know, my why is I have a niece and she's looking at what I'm doing, you know, she's really proud of me and I want to be that example for her and other women that you can achieve anything you want and I want her to feel like she's got a path and, and there's a way to do that. But in fact, that terrifies me more than anything that if this business falls apart, I don't want it. <laughs> Just like you, you have a, yeah. a three-year-old, yeah. right? And you don't want to disappoint them. So I think um, that part is important. What was the other, what was the question? The, Just how you define success in your yeah. life. So I think it's that. I think it's the money and then being an example and then leaving the planet a little bit better than when you were here. Yeah, you having know? that positive impact. Positive impact, trying to treat people with grace and kindness. I don't always do it. Sometimes I get irritated when my coffee's late at Starbucks or whatever. But I think if just on a daily basis, in a micro way, you can continue to be a kind person, to, to be warm, to give a smile to somebody that might need it. Um, I think if we all did more of that, the world would be a much better place. And I'm not, I don't do it well every day, but I, I do focus yeah. on it. Well, it can't be perfect, right? Yeah. But, if, but if you're conscious about it, yeah. you in general, right? Everybody, if, if you're conscious about it, mm -hmm. then then you're having that impact and you're getting a little bit closer every single day to the ideal version of yourself. Mm -hmm. All right, so last one. You and I are sitting here three years from now having a conversation. If you were to look back on that three year period in your life, how could you look back? What happened where you can look back and say that you were successful? Hmm. I think that um, the biggest thing is, is that I really did make an impact in my industry okay. and that I, we are seen as thought leaders, you know, in the industry that I have happy clients that want us to come back and, and refer us to their friends. I think that that's a sign of success financially and, you know, kind of doing things on my terms, you know, doing them with integrity and, and, and being ethical and, and, you know, thinking abundantly and trying to stay in that space, which is yeah. not always easy, you know, in running a business. Yeah. So I think those things would be. Well, perfect. Yeah. Um, where should people that are more interested in learning more uh, about you, about what you're doing, where should they go? You can go to my website, um, www.gallagherandconsultants.com, or you can reach out to me personally, terry at gallagherandconsultants.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's all free media, so I'm all over it. Right. And we'll put the links in the show notes oh, for all terrific. that, too, so yeah. that's, that's great. Well, I appreciate Thank you, you taking so the time. Thank you so much. I loved it. You did yeah. great. Well, thanks. You too. <laughs>